Ah, oh, I'm glad I've encountered you. There's still time. I know, I know, you don't understand. But permit me to explain, my friend. Here in Sandwich, you must be careful. This is Cape Cod's oldest town. It was founded by brave settlers only a few years after the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth on the Mayflower. And when so much time passes between the ancient past and our own times, well, strange things can happen. When the days become short and afternoon shadows darken and lengthen early, the day's light can die before you realize it. It is at that particular time that you must be very sure not to walk on Grove Street. Shawmy Pond's reflections may look pretty in the twilight, and the lights coming on at the old Newcomb Tavern may seem inviting, but do not slow your pace. I warn you, walk swiftly past the Old Town Cemetery, as fast as you can. You ask why, and I sigh, for again I must tell my bizarre and unbelievable story in hopes that you may be spared the terrifying experience that happened to me. One late autumn day, I decided to go for a short walk, planning to return home before dark set in. I found myself on Grove Street, passing by the Old Town Cemetery at just this hour of dying light and deepening shadows. Walking quickly past the heavy black metal gates and moss-covered headstones, I heard someone speak. I stepped aside to let them pass, and when no one passed, I turned around. But there was no one behind me, nor beside me. Again I heard a voice that seemed to be speaking to me. Bewildered, I looked into the cemetery, and walking toward me was a man, dressed in the clothes of another time. Follow me, he said in an eerie, unearthly voice. It is time for you to meet those of us who reside here. We who once knew and loved this town as you do. Come with me and hear our stories. As if in a trance, I followed him into the Sandwich Old Town Cemetery. And here is what he and the other ghosts, for ghosts they surely were, told me on that fearful night. My name, while in this place, was Mary Nye. I was born in the year 1761, more than 10 years before the revolution started. You can know from the dates on these old stones that I visited this place many times in sorrow and sadness, but sometimes for the peacefulness. Next to me is my husband, Zenas Nye. We had a good life together and together our hearts bore much grief. Of our children, Shadrach was only 17 when he died, a young man in the bloom of his life. And his brother Stephen died when he was 19. We didn't know how we could bear the news. Shadrach had died in Jamaica, and then Stephen had died on the Isle of May, off Scotland. But our two fine sons had died the same week of the same month of the same year. January 1805. I joined my loved ones here in 1839 when I was 78 years old. Zenas died 15 years earlier at 65. I'll read these words that someone wrote about me. I don't remember who and I don't remember why, but I can tell you this, the very last line is true. Marianne Nye. O oh, blessed life of service and love, full of such duties as God's angels know. His servants serve him day and night above. Thou served day and night, we thought, below. O oh, faithful heart that wrecked not care or pain, when duty called thee or when love did lead, thou gavest freely, asking not again the word of comfort or the costly deed. O oh, gentle hand, so busy evermore with healing touch, or helpful tenderness. Twas yours to lift the burdens others bore, your soul reward the joy of usefulness. We know not how to leave thee at the gate that opens for thee toward that city high where other hands in loving welcome wait. We shall long miss thee as we go our ways 
the home will miss thee from its broken band. For many a tear will tell thy sober praise, and all good works will miss thy helping hand. And yet, goodbye, goodbye, thou faithful soul. From toil and trouble thou hast earned release. Thy weary feet are resting at the goal. The pain of living ended in God's peace. I have been a slave for as long as I can remember. Long separated from my family, I served the Reverend Abraham Williams of the First Church. He was an honorable man who lived by virtue and morality. Why he owned me, I do not know. Thenceforth, I felt it my obligation to wholly and faithfully served the church. After many years of service, the right reverend passed to his heavenly father, scribing my freedom in his final will and testament. With my newfound independence, I left Sandwich and went to sea to become a steward. After 22 years, I amassed a tidy fortune when my health began to fail, I returned to my roots of sandwich to prepare to meet my maker. With my final breath, I donated my estate to the church to build a four-faced clock in the spire of the meeting house in honor of the reverend. But each time that clock rang out, the town folk said, there's old Titus calling out for freedom. The year was 1702, a warm sunny morn in New York. I stood waving from the pier to my lovely husband of 20 years. He had recently acquired the title of captain and was roaring to set sail on the Atlantic seas. Little did I know his first journey would also be his last. For long months I waited for my Peter to return to no avail. As summer days turned to frozen nights, my hope for his return began to dwindle. My loyal son Edward followed in the footsteps of his honorable father and led the household. We worked through December, Edward doing odd jobs for farmers and the like, whilst I spun wool and maintained our dwelling. It was until that fateful day wherein I spotted a traveler on horseback approaching our property with great speed. He arrived upon our doorstep, bowed his head, and handed me a thin piece of parchment from the town of Sandwich. Without a word, he rode into the distance. I unfurled the letter to discover a kindly man had found my husband and crew had washed ashore, mortally departed from this life. My vision grew dark. I took to rest for many days. I wept for what seemed an eternity. Edward tenderly caring to my condition. Many weeks later, I emerged from my woeful state, thanking my son for his hard work and determination. He is truly just like his father. I could barely fathom how I had behaved so selfishly. I journeyed to the town of Sandwich to find those who had discovered my husband and expressed my thanks. 
Using our great fortune, I donated the first bell of the land of the free to ring faithfully in the Church of Christ. There, my tumultuous heart could finally be laid to rest. I am Janneke von Borsen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to visit me. I have been here since 1725, and it gets lonely and cold, so I appreciate your visitation today. My name is John Pope. My father was Seth Pope, who was a very distinguished gentleman. He began his life working as an itinerant peddler throughout this whole area. He sold small home goods to the farmers and the families living in Sandwich and throughout the Southern District. However, there was a problem. The town fathers demanded, wanted only someone who was a property owner to be here. And since he did not own property, he was asked to leave immediately. And he agreed upon doing that but on the way out of town was rumored to have said, I will come back and buy this whole town. As time went on, my father became very wealthy and a very generous man. He in fact did come back to Sandwich, but while not buying the entire town, bought large parcels uh, for farming and parcels to build homes. He built a home for me on Tupper Road, on a rise overlooking the creek. He also built another house right here on Grove Street for my brother. And that house still stands beside the Newcomb Tavern. I was interested in being married and I met a beautiful young woman named Elizabeth Bourne. And we had a happy life together where we raised six children. And sadly, and unfortunately, she passed away at a very young age. And as the custom in those days, I married pretty quickly thereafter, a young woman named Experience Jenkins. And together we had three more children. And I'm pleased to tell you that of the nine children that I fathered, all nine lived to adulthood, but alas, Death comes at unwanted times and comes when we least expect it. And at the age of 50, I passed away in 1725. And I have been in this cold ground since that time. The time grows late and I must return to the spirit world. Thank you for coming and farewell. I'm Ezra Shaw Goodwin. It's humorous now to think that I spent most of my life wondering what death would be like. You see, I was quite the philosophical young boy in my day, endlessly pondering what lies beyond. I graduated from Harvard University in 1807 at the tender age of 20, which was an opportunity I have been eternally grateful. My time spent at Harvard acted as a gateway for me into the world of religion, I suppose. Six years later, I was ordained in the old meeting house. While yes, the meeting house will forever hold a dear place in my heart, my hunger for knowledge was too great for the old place to satisfy. It was then that I had been elected to be a member of both the Massachusetts Historical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Thankful to even be offered such a membership, I humbly accepted. I can proudly say that my life at both of these societies was well spent as I suddenly had an outlet to release all of my excess knowledge. I devoted much of my time to those organizations, however. My true passion had been studying the works as well as the Word of God. It became increasingly clear to me that I felt most myself when I was preaching the way of our Lord to others. 
Twas thereafter that I became pastor of the First Congregational Church opposite John Burr, where I remained until I went the way of all flesh. Even after my death in 1833, I had the ability to look back on my life and smile. I truly do believe that I have philosophical enlightenment as well as my love for God to thank for my success. But as I wander through the cemetery all these years later, I wonder if people who are living contemporarily now struggle with religion and science as I did hundreds of years ago. We were never a rich family. My father passed away when I was young, leaving my mother and brothers behind. Therefore, the responsibilities of head of the house fell upon my shoulders. But then the Civil War began. I watched as countless young men went to fight for their country and deeply admired their service. However, I had a personal obligation to my family. Desperate for affluence, I traveled to my father's place of work, the Sandwich Glass Factory. I was just a frail, uneducated boy, yet my father's friend, John R. Clayton, took me under his wing. He taught me about engineering, math, everything I knew. We worked tirelessly for many years, saving to provide for our families, scraping by with what little they provided us. One day, Clayton stormed in, wild-eyed and full of passion. He demanded a pay raise, but he was fired on the spot. Hearts ablaze with fury, we left the factory together. However, the factory found that their need for skilled workers to be great, and we returned with fresh salaries. We stayed until the factory closed in 1888, then parted ways. Hungry for adventure, I left the state and went to Illinois, where I invested every penny I had into real estate and accumulated much wealth. In my travels, I came across many memorials in honor of the hundreds of young soldiers who sacrificed their lives for the rights of their fellow man. When I finally returned to Sandwich, I knew I must laud those braver than I, using my great fortune. I erected the large memorial statue downtown with the message inscribed, erected in memory of the soldiers and sailors from this town, brave defenders of the Union and the flag we honor their noble deeds. Let us have peace. Yet, I still felt I hadn't done enough. Looking back on my life, I had many regrets and my time was dwindling. I always knew of my passion for engineering if I had followed it further, who knows where it may have led me. John R. Clayton saw that potential in me. He inspired me to continue working and to continue learning about what I loved. Therefore, I utilized the remainder of my fortune to form the Clayton Scholarship in the hopes I may give the education I wish I could have had to some other child who was just like myself. The fool will say in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on all of mankind to see there are, if there are any who understand, any who seek God. If he sees that everyone has turned away, all have become corrupt and there is no one who does good, not even one. It is when I deliver sermons such as these that my congregation erupts with chatter. An uproar, I say. They stake a claim at my supposed lies. They claim that my Calvinist views do not belong. So you must understand why I left that church and how the, those truly loyal to me followed suit. We united to form our own church, apart from the Methodist and Unitarian peoples of, who occupied this town. Our new assemblage combined our assets and constructed what is now known as the First Church of Christ. It is the most beautiful building in the States with a beautiful spire that you can now see through the trees, reminiscent of the designs of Christopher Wren. Our town newspaper, the Sandwich Observer stated, we can only say that the house of worship is thoroughly built of the best materials. 
and after a beautiful plan, and that it is fitted up as, in as good a style as any house of worship in the country. We had our daily sermons there, and it steadily grew in popularity. The church prior had been taken into the hands of the crook-nosed Ezra Shaw Goodwin, who greatly contrasted with my strong beliefs. He even set t townsman Matthias Bourne to irritate his barn animals during my sermons, causing a great ruckus during our holy ceremonies. However, as winter set upon us, it became increasingly arduous to properly heat our establishment due to its enormity. Thus, we set aside our differences and returned to the Unitarian Church for the season, and in return, our chapel hosted the summer oration. As I return to my grave, I am much heartened to see the trees and brush that obscured the view of my memorial and those on either side have been cleared away. Good evening to all of you and thank you for coming to visit me. It's been a long time since family and neighbors have come to see me and it's comforting to have you here. I have been lying beside my dear husband, Mr. Joshua Hall, for nearly 200 years. It does get lonely. Pray, allow me to introduce myself. I am Temperance Nye Hall. My father was Joseph Nye, and he was a descendant of the Nye family, who operated the grist mill in town on Old County Road. Do you know if the old homestead is still standing? The year of my birth was in 1727. My family were God-fearing people, and they named me Temperance, indicating that I should live by the virtue of moderation during my time on this earth. When I was 17, I became the good wife of Mr. Hall. That was in October of 1744, which means that we are celebrating our 275th wedding anniversary here in eternity. Oh my, that is a long time. My husband and I were truly blessed by our Lord, for we had 10 children together. The first was named Mary in honor of Mr. Hall's mother, and our last child was named Temperance in honor of me. She was born 24 years after giving birth, my giving birth to our first. Temperance married Dr. Jonathan Leonard. Do you think his home is still there on Main Street? By the grace of the Lord, all of my children live to be good adults. It was a very cold day in February of 1800 when my dear Joshua died, and I remember it well. We proceeded from the meeting house and passed the Newcomb Tavern until we arrived here. He was 80 years of age. Three years later, I was 76. I was laid to eternal rest beside him. My family inscribed my stone with a message Relic of the late Mr. Joshua Hall, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. I bid you farewell, follow the path of the Lord. My friend, I must be honest with you. I do not know if what happened to me was real or not. Did I dream it as I walked along the darkening road? To this very day, I do not know. But I assure you, those ghostly faces and their words will haunt me until the day that I too am laid to rest. sent his servant to the town to the place where she was dwelling saying you must come to my master dear if your name be Barbary Allen so slowly slowly she got up 
And slowly she drew nigh him, and the only words to him did say, Young man, I think you're dying. He turned his face unto the wall, and death was in him welling. Goodbye, goodbye to my friends all. Be good to Barbary Allen. When he was dead and laid in grave, she heard the death bells knelling, and every stroke to her did say. Hard-hearted Barbary Allen. Oh, mother, oh, mother, go dig my grave. Make it both long and narrow. Sweet William died of love for me. And I will die of sorrow. And father, oh, father, go Make it both long and narrow. Sweet William died on yesterday, and I will die tomorrow. Barbara Allen was buried in the old churchyard. Sweet William was buried beside her. Out of William's heart there grew a rose. Out of Barbary Allen's a briar. They grew and grew in the old churchyard till they could grow no higher. And yet they fall. A true lover's knot, and the rose grew.